A couple weeks ago, I preached on uh, basically serving Jesus, that Jesus was the servant king, right? And he, he is a servant king. And I believe that every one of us that are born again, we are called to do something for the Lord. I believe that he, he wants us to serve. But, but I, I want to make something clear this morning. Service does not define who you are in the Lord. Service does not define who you are in the Lord. Service develops who you are in the Lord. Okay? Service does not define who you are. It develops who you are in the Lord so that you can become mature, so that you can walk with Jesus, so that you can enjoy Him forever. And so, so with that being said, I remember years ago we had a, a lady that was in the sound booth. And she never got to sit with her kids, and uh, she got kind of gripey, and she got kind of, can I just say this? Uh, she got kind of overprotective of her position. Ever that happened? Got kind of overpositioned. And the next thing you know, it wasn't the family and all this. It was my ministry. Got a little bit territorial. And I was concerned for her soul. And so I walked up to her and I said, I said, what would your relationship be if you were not using your gift for the Lord here? She says, I don't know what my relationship would be if I wasn't using my gift for the Lord here. I said, that's why you've got to sit down. Because you're defining your relationship with the Lord based on what you do, not based on who you are in Him. With that being said, I want us to go. Have I said it yet? We're going to Luke, the fourth chapter. Every few years, I, 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 I want to touch on this because this is, this is part of my testimony. And how many you know, no one has arrived. None of us have arrived. The Apostle Paul said, I haven't, I haven't made it yet, but I'm going to press towards the mark of the prize for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So, so as Adam said, let's just not have analysis paralysis. Let's just start taking some steps in, in that direction. So Jesus, a picture of him being born again, gets out of the baptismal. And it says, then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Ghost, returned. Hey, can we stand for the reading of the word? I'm sorry, I backslid. I didn't do it. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Ghost, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. <clears throat> Anybody ever had that month? Of, of, I, I think I haven't been as obedient as I needed to, and I think I had a couple of years like that every once in a while until I learned the lesson. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward, when he had ended, he was hungry, and the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, now listen, so, so he's being tempted with what God said, like Adam was tempted with what God said, but he knew the heart of God, so he didn't allow Satan to twist that. By the way, the Bible says there are only three things that Satan can hit you with. The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Just three. There's not a million things. Now, now, there's a million different ways in which you could do it, but there's only th three things. The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. I would call this first one, hey, turn the stone into bread. I'd call that the lust of the flesh because he was hangry after 40 days, and I'm sure. Then the devil, having taken him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment, and the devil said to him, all this authority I will give to you, and their glory, for this was delivered to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Satan uh, received these kingdoms because Adam forfeited his authority. Therefore, if you will worship me, all will be yours. And Jesus said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship only the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. That, that's the lust of the eye right there. He, he, he brought him and showed him everything that he could have for free. He took him to what we, we would know as Amazon that day and said, 
All of this, I'm not even talking BOGO. I'm not talking buy one, get one free. All of this will be yours if you just, if you just submit yourself to me. Then he brought him to Jerusalem and he said, him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he said to them, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And in their hands, he will lift you up, lest you dash your foot against its own. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. He, I would say, I believe this is the pride of life. He lifted him up on a high place. And how many know pride comes before fall? He said, uh, he said just live a life. I'll, uh, I'll give you everything that God has without God. I'll exalt you. Now, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. And then Jesus turn, returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. I like that statement. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. I mean, no, that's internal. But it said he returned in the power of the Spirit. I mean, no, that's external. Okay, I'm going to stop right there because you guys have stood long enough. And he went out and he did things all over the world and saved our soul and defeated the devil. That's my paraphrase to that. Father, <laughs> add your blessing to the reading of your word. We thank you so much for our family of God. We thank you that he who began a good work in us is faithful and just to complete it until that day. In Jesus' name, amen. We begin to look at the text. I want to go on to say what my last thought was. There was a difference between him being filled with the Spirit and returning in the power of the Spirit. Or the Bible would have said, he started out with the Holy Ghost and he got out of his trouble and still had the Holy Ghost. But that's not what it says. Obviously, because of the temptation that he went through, it released the kingdom inside of him to a dimension that it had not been released prior to that time. And it was released because of one specific thing. And I believe it was this it was the fact that Jesus is going back, and if you look at the life of Jesus, he is walking through the Old Testament, fulfilling everything and uh, receiving everything back that Adam had lost. And so this is the first temptation of Jesus in that way, because the first thing that Adam lost was his identity. He lost his identity. Jesus kind of went through the same temptation that Adam did, hath God said. And it wasn't about just giving or manipulating Jesus to get stuff to come over to his side. It was a, if you are the son of God, having that settled in your heart to the core that you are a son. I don't want to say this, you're not a servant, even though we serve. Peter at our conference this year, the, the last night or the second night, he had a shirt and it, what did it say? Identity is everything. Say that with me. Identity is everything. Identity is how your heart sees itself. That's why the Bible says, guard your heart, keep it with all diligence, put a garrison around it, for out of it flow the issues of life. So I know this. You can be saved and not be secure in your identity. And you'll have, I'm going to say this, you can be saved and not secure in your identity and, and, and you will not have to just fight the devil all the time. You'll have to fight your own mindsets all the time. See, see, forgiveness gives you certain things. Forgiveness gives you access back to God. Forgiveness gives you access back to God. It takes away the shame of your past, right? And it also gives you mercy for other people that screwed up the way you screwed up. That's what forgiveness does. But, but what forgiveness doesn't necessarily do is release to you the security of the identity, the unique factor in which God made you. You know, when he made you, you he broke the mold. And if you try and be like anyone else, you'll only be second best. You, you are God's masterpiece. But, but the moment that you feel like you have to perform for identity or value, 
or self-worth, the moment you start to perform for those things, you become a slave to the law. See, God gives us these things freely. When when God sees you, by the way, the Bible says this. this This is so powerful. He created you in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the earth. Now, now, if, if I feel like in, in my spirit, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not saved. I'm not saying I'm not filled with the spirit. I'm not saying I'm not born again. I'm not saying I'm not forgiven. But, but, but if I have on myself that I have got to do something to be valuable, to have an identity, to be secure, to be accepted, then the next thing you know, not only will I usually be condemning myself all the time, but I will only relate with God's people to the degree that they do something for the relationship, for the affirmation, for the value. I want to say this. Every one of you, whether you do anything or not, are infinitely valuable to the Lord. When God called me to preach the gospel, while I was already preaching the gospel, let's say this. When God called me to pastor, I felt the calling on my life. And I asked the Lord this. I said, Lord, if I don't preach, are we still okay? He's like, if you don't, my relationship with you is not based on what you do. My relationship with you is based on something that I've done. My relationship, and and that freed me. Because you know what that means? That means that God loves me regardless of whether I do anything for him or not. And can I tell you something? God don't need your help. You need to do something so that you can know him in that dimension and in that way. But God doesn't, God doesn't need your help. He just wants to walk out the giftings, callings, unique ability with you so you can know him in that deep way. 1 Corinthians 12, or 13 and 12 says this. When I see him, I'll be like him. Because I will know as I am known. Say that again. Paraphrasing, when I see him, I'll be like him because I'll know even as I am known. When I see him, I'll be like him because I'm going to know as I'm known. When I see him, what am I going to know? Underline that in the flesh. When I see him, what am I going to know that I didn't know? And I'm not just, I'm not projecting that because the Bible's many faceted, you know, it's many layered. How many of you know a lot of the things that we read in the Bible are going to be future truth? And most of the things we read in the Bible are true today, right? And so there's layers. It's like you're saved, you're being saved, you're going to be saved, right? You're healed, you're being healed. One of these days you're going to get a glorified body that has totally arrived. So when I see him, How many know we don't have to wait to see him to see him? This is relationship language. When I see him, I will be like him because I will know even as I have known. What will I know? How the worlds were created, how he made angels, why a dog circles three times before it lays down, all the mysteries. I don't think it's talking about any of that stuff. I think what we know is we're going to know who we are even as we know who he is. So I want to turn that around. As, as we seek to find out who he is, what happens is that the Bible says, like a mirror, we begin to see who we really are. When I begin to see who he really is, all of a sudden it begins to transform my relationship to him where all of a sudden grace comes into my life and it's not me looking at a velvet picture of Jesus in a church anymore. It's me looking in a mirror and the Bible says that when I see him for who he is, he begins to change me from glory to glory, not just because I see him, but because I see myself differently. I see myself differently in that. I always say this, there's four major questions. Who am I? Where do I come from? What's my purpose? Where am I going? Number one, need acceptance. Number one, fear rejection, right? It's driving humanity. It's driving everybody right now. Somebody says, where do you come from? Most people would say, well, Dan comes from Duggar, Indiana. Or New Hope in Origins. New Hope's not a good name, or not a bad name. A little bit better, more scriptural than Duggar anyway, possibly. But 
We've got to look at these questions from God's perspective to change our mindset on who we are. You know what I hate? I hate when Christians struggle with identity issues and walk in condemnation. Because you realize that's how you see yourself based on what you've experienced in life and the ramifications of that. But you realize today that is not how God sees you at all. He does not see you as half done and half baked. If you get a really, 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 really good prophetic word about who you are, my mindset always begins to go back and think, well, he's speaking that over me based on potential. I have the potential of being that. No, God didn't say you have the potential of being that. He looked at Gideon and said, mighty man of valor. And Gideon hadn't fought a battle yet, but in God's mind, he was already who he created him to be from his perspective. Gideon's identity had to catch up with that. Had to catch up with who he was in God's view, in God's eyes. You might have been conceived in rape. But let me tell you this. You might have been conceived in sin. David said, I was conceived in sin. You might have been conceived out of some, something horrible. But the reality, that has nothing to do with who you are. The sum total of your experience has nothing to do with your value or who you really are. We've got amnesia to who we are. Who you really are is who God created you to be. And I'll tell you, He will never, He refuses to see you any different than that. Who you really are is who He created you to be. And the great thing about this this walking, I even hate to call it Christianity because Christianity makes it a culture. I like to call it being in Christ because it's a relationship. Walking with Him. For the first two years of my salvation, I can't, I, you, you get a zeal to serve people. or hey, You got a zeal to do something for the Lord. You're appreciative for everything God's done in your life. And I'd say, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What's my calling? What's my calling? What's my calling? Anybody been there? What's my calling? I know there's something big on the inside of me. What, what do you want me to do? And, and Jesus would never answer me anything specific. I mean, he might say, well, pick up cigarette butts in the parking lot, but I didn't feel like my calling was the quicker picker up, right? I mean, that was... It was... Every time I'd ask him, what do you want me to do? He'd always respond to me on something he wanted me to be. Be forgiving. Be joyful. Be thankful. Be patient. Ouch. Be holy, for I'm holy. Look at me and do that. See me and do that. See me and become that. You're not a human doing, you're a human being. You're begotten of God. See who I am and let me transform who you are through the process. I got saved today, Jade. A little bit of my testimony, got saved at age eight. I had the wilderness experience, everybody will, from when you get born again. I mean, you get born again, you come out a new creature. There is an old creature, like a gargoyle, waiting to get you back into an old identity and keep you from your new destiny. And so I got born again, I got in the baptismal, I walked out of it, and all of a sudden I began to, I won't go into a long story, but I began to question my salvation. He didn't say it like this, but he said, are you really saved? Are you, are you really a son of God? You had a dirty thought. One of the things that hit me when I first got saved, when I first got saved, I felt saved. I felt it. Everything the preacher preached on was exactly what I was thinking that week. I, I didn't know where to begin in the Bible, so I, I'd just stick my finger in the Bible, and I would open it, and it'd be exactly what I needed that moment. Did you know that day ended? It was a wilderness. Jesus was alone in the wilderness, led by the Spirit into a place where no human being could fix the problem. He had to come to his own identity on his own with the Father. 
And so sermons weren't feeding me anymore. The Bible wasn't feeding me anymore. I wouldn't, I, and then it got me, I didn't feel saved. It's not a feeling, by the way. It's a response to who he is, which is called faith. And so I, I decided that, you know, I believe that God was real, but God was far off. And so I began to look at my identity and other things. And so Smokey and the Bandit came after becoming a cowboy. My identity was I was going to be a cowboy. And uh, that doesn't work with a quarter acre yard and a dad that, you know, shoots your dog every three years or something like that. It was good. Just, I, sorry. These, it was the 70s. These were different times. Okay, just him. <laughs> My dad didn't believe in vet, vets. So it's quiet in this Presbyterian church. I just, I just offended some people. I'm sorry. <laughs> didn't become a cowboy. Didn't become Burt Reynolds. Didn't get Trans Am. Wanted to be a kung fu fighter and a lawyer after that. Found out I couldn't fight and wasn't good in school. By the way, if you are a good kung fu fighter, you would be good to be a good lawyer too, just in case. Then I was going to be rich. My first, my first car that I got, my dad got for me, and me and my grandpa fixed it up. It was a 71 Cadillac Sedan DeVille. I was going to be rich. I was going to fake it till I make it. It had four and a half inch white walls. Remember that? I think Lori was in the tr trunk a couple times. We got pulled over seeing how many people we could fit in that Cadillac, right? And so... <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't do this. I, I, I wasn't sanctified then, all right? <laughs> so, so four and a half inch fat white walls. It looked like something Rick James... James Brown would have. It had Landau bars, like the Hearst Landau bars. It was all white. It was like Boss Hog. Had a 501 engine, and I could push the pedal to the metal, and I could watch the gas gauge go. <laughs> and I had eyes odds. That was really cool. I mean, at least at Spencer Owen County, if you had an eyes odd, you were like top class. Then I found out I couldn't afford the gas for the car, washing dishes at the Canyon Inn. I couldn't keep up the facade of my new identity. Oh, yeah, and a girl by the name of Natalie one day was looking at my shirt in front of a bunch of kids, and she, she saw it had an alligator on it. It looked like an Izod, but something was funky about it, so she grabbed the back of my tag real quick, and it said J.C. Penney. <laughs> and my mom had been going to garage sales, and buying all these uh, generic shirts and sewing alligators on them. <laughs> and all the kids are... <laughs> so, so you, everybody wants to be the best at something. Everybody wants to be the best in some culture at something. Everybody wants to belong. Everybody wants to be accepted. Every, everybody wants to be valued. So... Because I couldn't keep the standards of identity that I was setting for myself, I decided that I would just find a different standard. I sold my Cadillac. My dad allowed me to get a Harley Davidson at age 17. Probably not a good thing to do. But uh, let me, and so, so I decided that I would begin to live, not saying that people ride Harleys are substandard, but I'm saying the people I was running around with, the culture was very substandard. So I wanted to be the best. So if I was going to be the best, I was going to be the best of the worst. At least, at least if I lowered the standard, maybe I could be the best at something. And so what ends up happening? Uh, now I'm a biker. If I'm going to be a biker, I'm going to be a real biker. I'm going to have to pull my bangs out of my belt. I'm not going to bathe for days, okay? I'm going to grow a beard. I'm going to not like people that don't look like me. I'm going to be a non-conformist. I'm going to break the rules just because that's what we do. And then Jesus touched me. And I got born again. And I woke up the next day and I didn't feel like a biker anymore. Definitely didn't feel like a cowboy, a lawyer, a kung fu fighter, Burt Reynolds, or anything else. I didn't know who I was. 
And so what ended up happening is, you know, I went to this little old church with all these old people. And so God sent me somewhere where I could not fit into a subculture and conform to their identity. The only way I could conform to their culture is if I dyed my hair white and got a walker. Hey. So now, now I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the young guy with long hair that hangs out with all the old ladies. And I'm like, who am I? Who am I? I began to seek the Lord and He began to show me who I was. Just like He showed Peter who He was. Do I say I know completely who I am? No, I don't. I don't. There was a guy in church years ago and he, uh, he was freaked out. He kept having a dream. He kept having this nightmare, call it, where there was this, there was this dead guy, like, like a zombie, chasing him around the house that looked just like him. And the last dream he had was he had the dead guy on his back and he was carrying him. He said, what do you think that means? I said, let go of the old identity. Bury the dude. I mean, put him down. He, dead people don't kill people, right? The reality is, is the Bible says that each and every one of us, <laughs> we were created in Christ before the world's foundations. Get your mind around that. Before you ever were here, you were in Him. This is, this is not Scripture. This is a hypothesis. This is just a guess. What if when we get to heaven, it just feels like, oh my gosh, this was home. We've been here before. <laughs> we get a total recall. It's like, now I remember... Because I was created, I might have been conceived 42 years ago, I wish, I'm, fi I'm almost 50, I'm dialing it back. I might have been conceived 50 years ago. I still feel like I'm 42, whatever that means. I, I, I might have been conceived 50 years ago, but I was created in Christ before the foundation of the earth. And who He created me to be is who I really am. And the joy of this world is knowing Him and through that discovering who we are. The Bible says this, your life is hid in Christ with God. Get that? Okay. Here's you. Here's your life. It is hid in Christ with God. I call that the Holy Trinity. You know why? Because you've got the Holy Ghost. And He's inside of you. Figure that out. I don't... So, as you begin to serve God, this life that's hid in Christ with God begins to do this. And He says, hey, you want to know something about me? Let me tell you something about yourself. You know something about me? Let me tell you something about yourself. Look, you know something about me? Let me tell you something about yourself. It's like, I had a friend, Roger Miller, still a friend. Um, but he's crazy. Um, he came to visit me after I'd gotten born again. He actually had come to church once, drove down. And as we were coming back to my cabin afterwards, he was looking at me. And I'm like, what, Roger? He's like, this is who you were always supposed to. He said, I saw you up there. This is who you've always been supposed to be. I thought that was a profound statement. He saw me in my element, which is not preaching. I mean, full of joy, full of peace, loving people, not bitter, not critical, not cynical. My life hidden. I'd say that I got like five names in this congregation. I, I'm looking at your face right now. That's why I'm not looking at your face right now. I got like five five names in this in this church right now. Then it's like you don't know who you are. But he knows who you are. And if you'll let him, this great, this great and wonderful, it's a it's better than a cruise. It, it, it's better than a vacation. This this quest, this adventure, God will begin to show you who you are. And you look at yourself in the mirror this morning and say, you know what, I'm perfect, but I like me.
you know what? When you like you, you don't need people to like you. You want people to like you, but you don't need people to like you. Because your identity is not based on how they feel about you. Your identity is based on who you are in God. Some people don't get born again because they think Christianity is about behavior. Being in Christ is about being in Christ is not about behavior. I can sleep in a garage and not be a Corvette. I can go to church and not be saved. I cannot do any of the things that we would call capital sins and still be lost. Christianity, serving Christ, is not about behavior. It is about identity. And whatever we behold is what we become. That's why Jesus tells us to seek His face. In closing, in the, in the book of Revelation, you know, I've, I was always taught to cast things. In fact, I, I just got this this morning in study. I, I'm starting to look at things differently. Yeah, some things are future, some things are now, some things are both. There's future ramifications and there's right now realities to it. Because how many know the kingdom's in the future? But also, how many know the kingdom's now? You step into a room and they say, where's the kingdom of God? Say, you're looking at it. Let the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf speak. Marriages get back together. People get their joy back. People be delivered from demons. The kingdom of God's in, at hand. It's tangent. It's, it's within us. So there's future and there's right now. But in the, in the book of Revelation, one of the rewards that saints get is God the Father gives them a little white stone with a, their new name written on it. And it says that nobody knows the name but God who gave it and the person that gets it. I mean, that's, that's pretty special. That, that's, that's very intimate, very intimate. What if it already happened? What if it already happened? The Bible says in Ezekiel that he beheld until, no, I think it was Daniel, the image of all the nations and all the kingdoms, and a little white stone was hewn from the mountain without hands. And it said this little white stone hits the feet of the image, and it's destroyed. And the little stone grows to be a great mountain. That little white stone is Jesus. You've already got the little white stone that's destroyed the kingdoms of this world. You've already got the little white stone that destroyed Goliath and destroyed the enemies of God's people. And written upon that little white stone is a special name, a special way in which God sees you that only you and Him can find out together. Let's stand up if we could this morning. Pray this over us this morning, Lord Jesus. Help us to see you so we can see ourselves the way that you see us. So that all the insecurities all the sense of lack of self self-worth the hyper-religious activity of us trying to earn acceptance with you, that it's all gone. As the insecurities bubbled up in Jeremiah about being young and about being this and about being that, what the Lord said to Jeremiah is, be quiet. Like, man, I knew you before you were born. I know you. You don't know you. Wake up with my voice to who you really are. Lord, I pray that you would awaken us to who we are. Not just more than conquerors, not just overcomers, 
Not just blessed, not just beloved, not just foreknown, not just predestined, not just called, not just glorified. I'm talking specific. I'm not talking general. Show us who we really are to you, that special, unique factor, how you made us so we could be comfortable in the skin that you put us in. And we can walk in harmony with your spirit. I just say to somebody this morning, if if you want to accept Jesus into your heart, You don't know yourself. You're not a race. You're not a color. You're not a creed. You're not just a male or a female. You're not just a banker or a biker. You're just not rich or poor. You're just not educated or unlearned. You're just not an ex-drug addict or somebody that's been divorced. You're, You're not a title. You're not an experience. You're a being perfectly created in the heart and the mind of God. And he wants to bring you into that reality today. If you want to accept Jesus into your heart, I want you to slip up your hand and I want to pray for you because you are so special. You're so special. 